Um, I'd like to say Enyambonga, which means thank you to everyone at Elon University for welcoming me uh, today. I spent some time in a classroom, I spent some time with faculty, and now get, uh, get a chance to engage with you. And especially to Brooke Barnett, a new friend, and Jeffrey Clark for inviting me in the first place. What I'd like to do tonight is share with you some thoughts about diversity, social justice, and our shared future uh, on a hybridizing and a hybridizing postmodern, urbanizing and globalizing planet, based in part on doing journalism in the developing world for the last 30 or 40 years, and in particular, this recently completed project in South Africa. And what a ripe moment it seems to me to be for us to consider these themes. One day after the National Federal uh, Holiday to mark the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 50 years since the March on Washington for racial and social justice in this country, and beginning this very month, a year-long commemoration in South Africa of two decades since the fall of apartheid that peculiar and extreme form of racial segregation once defined by the United Nations as a crime against humanity. In that very place where that crime against humanity took place, following hundreds of years of colonial rule and uh, more than four decades of pervasive racial oppression, that a new order emerged which is rooted in a promise to create a non-racial, non-sexist, anti-homophobic, and more egalitarian country of the southern tip of Africa. Uh, in a nation steeped in the rankest kind of racism, which labored under a vast edifice of detailed laws that once circumscribed everything from where a black South African could live or work in his own country, who, sh who she could marry or have sex with, uh, a new kind of one person, one vote democracy was born. And in recent memory, in uh, your lifetimes, where change longed for through generations and only half achieved has proceeded in fits and starts, and we're gonna talk about that. Perhaps that description sounds a little bit familiar. There are two important points of reference to make to connect our experience here to the experience of South Africans. One is that uh, the architects of apartheid uh, came to the United States in the 1940s. They visited the southern states. Uh, they came to Alabama, Mississippi. They also came to North Carolina. And part of what they designed in South Africa was an attempt to nationalize and make better the lines of segregation and racial oppression that existed in the southern United States. So important to understand that history, that link in history that we have uh, to them. Second point of reference, probably important to point out, uh, uh, especially for the students here, is that when I was your age and going to college, the fight against apartheid was an enormous global campaign that uh, had uh, inspired the activism of students across the world. Uh, I would liken it in scale and scope to the global uh, fight maybe 100 years earlier to end slavery. And you know, everybody from somebody like me uh, going to school out in California to our current president, Barack Obama, had us a kind of sem seminal political experience getting involved in a campaign to put outside pressure on another government to end racial oppression. And uh, as a result, beginning to understand links between a fight for liberation far across the ocean in a different context, in a different place, across lines of nation, race, class, and culture, and the struggle for freedom here, seeing those links. Um, so I've spent chunks of my time in the last 10 years trying to figure out what happened 
in that new democracy since liberation occurred in 1994. I began visiting the country just 10 years ago, so kind of halfway in, and then devoted considerable time uh, in the past 10 years in a series of magazine stories and the book after Mandela uh, to understanding the politics, culture, economics, and social dynamics at play uh, during the second decade. I want to make the case, I'll just put the thesis right up front rather than making you dig for it, that there are connections worth making uh, between our existence in the US and the possibility of success, alternately the risk of failure, uh, in the South African democratic experiment. Uh, experiment. So I want to begin uh, with a couple of more proper greetings. Mulweni, Alo, Dumelan, good evening, Sani Bonani. And maybe you can greet me back from Sani Bonani by saying Saubona. Try it out, Saubona. So I'm only one person, so you greet me by saying Saubona. You are many people, so I say Sani Bonani. Um, I like to begin that way in a talk like this because those are just five beckoning gestures uh, of greeting from among 11 official languages in the new South Africa. Uh, just that sampling launches us right away into something important at the heart of the liberation struggle led by the African National Congress of Nelson Mandela since the party's founding in 1912. At its core, change in South Africa for, uh, during the first two decades of democracy involves a monumental uh, transition. It's a still unfolding experiment in moving from a society that privileged only one skin color and two languages, Afrikaans and English, and marginalized all the rest to a place where multiplicity, variety, and difference does not necessarily lead to marginalization. In the founding constitution, finalized in 1996, not only that kind of range of difference, 11 official languages, but socioeconomic rights, including the right to food and water, to work, to housing, are marbled into the founding document, the constitution of the country. Those commitments and fidelity to them are also the reason uh, women are represented at 50-50 parity with men in parliament, and as a national commitment by the ANC to top decision-making levels of the party and government. Take a look at Congress today, and maybe the effort to uh, elect more women as uh, senators. Uh, look at those numbers and you'll see that on that score, as in several others, uh, South Africa puts the U.S. to shame. Um, at the same time, and you know, you've got to be quick on the mark to bring it up, three of four young black men in a majority black country are unemployed. HIV directly affects uh, one in six South Africans. And the levels of violence, including rape and murder, are astronomically high. So part of the reason it took me a while to get a handle on this story was grappling with those contradictions. How do we uh, understand the promise made in 1994 and the faltering progress towards that vision 20 years later? Um, in effect, I think that I've been grappling in the process of reporting out this book with one of the big mysteries that any of us face in our lives, either as individuals or as a group. And that is uh, those times when our history, either as an individual or as a group, seems to swamp us. Because the traumas are so, so enormous, the history imposes so many constraints on us. Um, and those times in history where some people, some of the time, manage to find the wiggle room to escape history's grasp. So that's part of what I uh, want to talk to you 
uh, about tonight, is that effort in this uh, work to understand how, to a certain degree, uh, this experiment in creating a new uh, kind of democracy uh, uh, was taken up by a group of people did, who did create wiggle room for creating something uh, brand new. Um, so I want to give you a sense of the place and the range of, uh, of uh, uh, life uh, prospects for people from a township to Johannesburg, one of the most interesting uh, cities on the face of the planet, to very rural areas, and just suggest that you think a little bit as we go along about, uh, we often talk in, in, in the United States about the difficulty of having honest conversations across lines of race or age uh, ethnic background, culture, or language. I want you to think a little bit about the cultural, uh, culture and language piece of it. I told you 11 official languages. There's a long time historic division in South Africa between the Amakaba, meaning more rural dwellers, believers in traditional religion, uh, people of the mud, non-Christians, and the Amakoboka, uh, people who are more Christianized and more uh, comfortable in that setting, maybe than that one. Um, so let me back up for a minute and, and explain how the research for the book happened. Um, first, I want to confess that I went to South Africa with zero, exactly zero intention of doing this book, or of writing at all about South Africa. I came to Medill uh, School of Journalism 10 years ago, uh, partly because uh, the then dean said, if you come, we can get you back to Africa. You can take the students and drop them off in South Africa, where they'll be working in newsrooms. And you can go off to do your magazine work in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or in Zimbabwe, or someplace where active conflict is going on, uh, where uh, you'd be able to generate magazine assignments. Because in general, assigning editors want to know that if they send a reporter to Africa, that there will be some conflict involved. Armed conflict, usually, right? Uh, that's, that's the story um, that we know very well how to cover. Um, and what happened to me um, is that I planned to leave. I plan to do other kinds of stories. I, uh, uh, in one direction, I thought I might go off and do uh, a series of pieces on bonobos, gorillas, and chimpanzees in various sites. I'd had a long time interest in that. Or I thought I would go uh, finally to the Congo or Burundi uh, or Rwanda and, uh, and cover uh, continuing conflict. And what happened is that I got into these newsrooms, so I was taking my students into newsrooms where they would be working, and it was a mind-blowing experience, having been in newsrooms, at, in newspapers, at broadcast outlets, and having run a magazine, um, because here were newsrooms where the media had been largely organized uh, in order to deliver service to eight or nine percent of the population, white readers in either Afrikaans or English, and all of a sudden, they were being transformed as vehicles for telling important stories to the rest of the population. And as a result of that, of course, just like in the United States, when a new market, a new audience is identified, suddenly a realization, well, if we're gonna be uh, covering Tosa speaking people, we better recruit some closest speaking reporters. And all of a sudden, 80% of the population, black population, 11% of the mixed race colored population, young people had journalism put on their radar and were flooding into these newsrooms. And I was walking in right at that moment. So I had this dual mind-blowing opportunity, which was 
God, I can see a society in the midst of great change. And I can see how that's happening, you know, in newsrooms, in the environments that I've, I've, I've worked in in all my life. So, you know, I would plan to leave and some astonishing conversation would happen in a newsroom and I would stay. And then I would plan to leave again and then uh, a, a battle uh, for control of the African National Congress uh, broke out that threatened to split the party, destabilize the country. And I thought, my God, I've been dropped completely by serendipity. No, uh, uh, I'm owed no respect for having been there at the moment. I'm only owed a little bit of credit for getting an inkling that something amazing was unfolding in front of me that I had a chance to chronicle. Um, so, uh, so that's what I began to do in 2006. Um, I first spent a fair amount of time uh, just trying to worm my way in to a level of confidence with the new political elite running the country. One of the advantages, this is what I would say to, to journalists who are thinking about doing global journalism, uh, one of the advantages of covering a uh, emerging democracy, a new country, is that you can get all three presidents in one slide. Uh, uh, and, 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 and tough to you know, know all the nuances of the biographies of these three gentlemen, but easier than having to remember dozens or uh, go back through uh, US history. So of course, the three of them are Nelson Mandela uh, in the center, um, the founding president of the country, who as all of you I'm sure know, uh, was a uh, guerrilla, once uh, uh, classified as a terrorist uh, by the US government, uh, in prison for, uh, imprisoned for 27 years, uh, who emerged, uh, was released in 1990, ended up uh, leading the negotiations that led to the end of uh, the white regime, and uh, was elected president in 1994. He uh, famously served one term, stepped away from power. Uh, on, his, on your right is his successor, Thabo Mbeki, and on his left is the current president of the party and the country, uh, Jacob Zuma. Um, let me give you the really brief history from the top down, because most of what I want to talk about is the view from the bottom up, from the, uh, uh, from the street and from the view of the next generation. Thabo Mbeki, uh, largely known outside of the country for having been an AIDS denialist. Um, uh, uh, but there are a lot of important things in addition to that that are important to know. Uh, he was uh, the, the person who basically served as prime minister under Mandela, actually uh, uh, created, created a lot of the conditions in terms of management of the economy that allowed for a smooth transition. Um, uh, he was in exile for nearly 30 years. He came back to run a country that he had been away from most of his adult life. Um, I, I, I'm sure in uh, history books 50 years from now, HIV will still be uh, among the first couple paragraphs because he and the health minister next to him resisted uh, and delayed uh, delivery of antiretrovirals uh, uh, to public health clinics for years. Uh, and a, a study at Harvard tells us that at least 300,000 people died need, needlessly as a result of that decision. Um, so that was a huge shock. But it's part, it helps us understand a little bit about the structural reasons. It was difficult to move more quickly towards that vision of a non-racial, non-sexist, egalitarian society. Because on the same day that democracy arrived in 1994, HIV walked in the door. Um, and as, as I said, the result was the spread of, uh, of a disease which now uh, one in six South Africans uh, carry the virus. And if you begin to wrap your minds around that level of trauma, if you, if you really think about hundreds of years of colonialism, more than 40 years of apartheid, and then bam, rat right out of the trap, as they say in Texas. You know, this additional 
devastating trauma. Just turn around a little bit and do a count. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you begin to get a sense of the direct impact of that intersection of the arrival of this other world of historical force on the same day. Um, and then President Zuma, not known as an AIDS denialist, uh, uh, but somebody who, uh, if, you've, if you've done reading about current South African politics, is a, um, a, a complicated and uh, mixed grill report, right? So when I met him for the first time in 2006, he was on trial for rape. He had been accused of rape. Uh, and he had been formally charged uh, with uh, corruption. Uh, and uh, most of my friends in the city uh, kept saying to me, I, we don't understand why you're spending so much time trying to get Zuma to talk to you. He's passed his sell by date. Uh, he's never going to come back. And I, I have never seen a politician anywhere in the world uh, rise again from the kind of uh, uh, nadir he had reached. Um, but uh, I didn't have any prescience about it. I simply had had the experience of bouncing back and forth between the cities and rural areas and townships where the way in which he was viewed was entirely different than the way he was seen in the city. And so I knew that in this battle between him and Thabo Mbeki for control of the party, for control of the country, that it was going to be an interesting fight. I didn't have any idea how it would come out. I just knew that it was going to be an interesting fight and that he represented something interesting in a new country that had been led so far by Nelson Mandela, somebody who was a lawyer, who had been, uh, become highly educated, had worked in a profession. Uh, between uh, his, his successor, Thabo Mbeki, who had gotten a master's degree at, the University of, at Sussex University in England in economics, um, highly educated. And Jacob Zuma, who uh, had been a shoeless uh, cowherd in rural KwaZulu-Natal, um, raised by a single mother, never went to school, learned to write on the University of Robben Island, that island prison, uh, where he was imprisoned for 10 years for sabotage and conspiring to overthrow the government. Uh, and uh, he represented this part of the movement that had been involved in guerrilla uh, activity, uh, intending to take the country the Castro way armed revolution. He had been the chief of Contoe uh, Siswe, the armed wing's uh, intelligence uh, arm. And so I figured he was going to be important. And I tried to uh, implement some of the lessons I try to teach my own students about how do you get into the confidence of somebody who's very different uh, than yourself? And how do you approach them in a way that gets a fuller, deeper, and richer story. I mean, it would be easy to walk away and do the daily story, which is there's remarkable staying power by this figure who was accused of rape and acquitted and has allegations of corruption, right? That's an easy story to tell. The more complicated story to tell is who is he, what drives him, and what is it about that story that generates support for him in spite of all these uh, 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 circumstances. So uh, I think I want you to hear his voice um, and uh, just uh, set up the clip by saying this. Um, I had many negotiations with him about whether he would agree to do an interview. Uh, and finally, when we started, I think I, I shocked him by, uh, by starting from the beginning and really wanting to know something about those years uh, when he was shoeless, uh, fatherless, uh, uh, in, in, in the wilderness. We talked a lot about that. And then I took a big risk with him. Uh, he's uh, married to more than one woman. Uh, polygamy is legal in South Africa. 
uh, in some uh, in, in some groups, there is a tradition of polygamy. And I just decided um, I wouldn't assume anything about his understanding of what uh, uh, informed his decision to take a second wife. I would just ask him in a very conversational way what kind of conversation he had had with his senior wife, uh, Ma Kumalo, at the point when the decision, he made the decision to take a second wife. Um, and uh, as you'll hear, he, uh, he replies at first uh, that n he's not going to talk about it with me. And I'd like you to hear what happens next. You know, my own personal life is, is a long story in itself. <laughs> that's why I always... So we need another series of interviews. <laughs> that's why I always try not to talk about it. Okay. Have heart it. Because it has a lot of emotional things as well. Mm. That's why I always say the one who would know my story genuinely should know it completely. Mm. <clears throat> because it has a lot of nitty-gritty details, mm. my own principles mm. as a person the kind of things I did, why I did X, Y, Z. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> it needs its own mm. time. One time I was being interviewed by journalists in my own home at Nganda. Mm. And uh, Makumalo uh, was walking around giving us tea, etc. And I said to this journalist, you know, whenever you ask me about my personal life, I've always said, I'll say this in my book. So I said, do you see this woman who's walking up and this is my wife, it's my first wife. Mm. She has a long story. Mm. We were involved in the very, very late 60s. When I went to Robben Island, she was a girlfriend. She's one of the girlfriends that remained with me, dedicated to me, mm. until I came out of Robben Island. And I got married to her. Because I thought That's she worth a lot, huh? That kind of loyalty, <clears throat> 10 yes, years. absolutely. Yeah. I said, if I don't marry this woman, then I wouldn't know what type of woman I'm looking for when I'm a freedom fighter. Mm. Got married to her. Then when she was expecting, I left the country. And that shook her and she aborted. Oh, no. <clears throat> and I left the country. I'm just giving you the yeah, highlight yeah, yeah. to understand yeah. why, why yeah. I would like to give a total mm. picture. So you see what begins to happen. He's not going to tell me anything about it, and then he's going to tell me all about it. And, uh, and the story as it emerges is that uh, the one time he tries to get his senior wife out of the country, uh, he's in a borderline uh, state um, training guerrillas. Um, she's, uh, she's captured. She aborts uh, the child she's carrying. And she returns to the village, uh, and, she, uh, and she sends a message to him through an interlocutor saying, uh, I, I will never try to leave the country again. We've lost our child, um, and I, I will wait here for you. He subsequently sends a message to her 12 years later saying, um, I, I intend to have children, and I can't come back and she offers her permission uh, for the taking of the second wife. Now, what he doesn't tell her is that he's uh, also been courting a third woman and doesn't ask for the permission to take a third wife. But still, there's nuance there that establishes a basis for us to begin to have a conversation about many other things, including uh, politics. It turns out that he becomes much more expansive about politics. Uh, uh, he ends up telling me um, on the presidential jet uh, uh, what he's been doing on his trips to China, never revealed before but revealed for the first time in this book. Uh, he refers to Europe as those little countries, you know. All kinds of things that he would never say in public, but began to see me as part of the woodwork, as somebody who could be confided in, could be trusted um, to tell things that he might not tell anybody else, uh, and that I wouldn't take advantage of, of that relationship. So 
Part of, the, part of the job was to tell the upstairs part of the story. The other part of the job was to uh, uh, tell the uh, generational story. Um, uh, and I chose to do that uh, through two primary vehicles. One was I was reading a lot of social science to try to get a sense of what the generational differences were. I was looking at a lot of polling. I was doing a lot of group interviews and individual uh, interviews around the country. So I probably did something like 350 individual interviews with people in different parts of the country, deep uh, uh, individual interviews. And then out of that, I called six people uh, who I would primarily thread the narrative through. Three of them with well-known names, Nelson Mandela's grandson, Jacob Zuma's daughter, uh, Thomas Marie, the son of the leader of the opposition, and then three unknowns. Um, and I want to, want to just uh, 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 give you a sense of what came out of that and how it informed, uh, how it informed the rest of the work. Um, so uh, Indaba Mandela on the left um, is the uh, son of one of Nelson Mandela's sons. I, I, I chose to uh, hang out with him partly uh, because he's a very interesting person on his own account, and partly because at the age of 11, uh, shortly after Nelson Mandela's release from prison, he was uh, sent for by the old man, as he calls him, uh, and lived with him. So Nelson Mandela had stopped uh, agreeing to interviews by the time I came to the country, uh, and it gave me kind of access to the Mandela family and, uh, and, and, and to the old man himself in a way that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And then also it gave me access to this uh, younger representative of emerging black elite in the country because I wanted to hear directly from them how were they understanding what the Nelson Mandela legacy meant and what it ought to mean. Um, and the first time I met Indaba, it completely freaked me out because he's a, the spitting image of his grandfather at the same age. And as you'll hear, the voice is very similar. Um, but this is what he said when I asked a very basic question, which is, how do you understand the legacy of your grandfather? And what's your biggest concern? And his biggest concern uh, was that, of course, that political liberation has not led to material freedom for the vast majority uh, in the country. And that he thought a bling bling westernized culture was overtaking uh, the sensibilities of people in his same group moving up into positions of power. What is it really all about at the end of the day? Mm. You know, what is life about? Is it about acquiring the riches? Yes, you have to obviously live and have a, a decent standard of living, mm. you know. But um, we must remember that we are the ones that created the system, you know, and that shouldn't basically create us, in other words, mm. money, our, you know, status in terms of our occupation, you know. Um, there's a greater thing out there at the end of the day, you know. I believe that um, Ultimately, we are in a battle with ourselves, mm. you know. Mm. Um, nobody will tell you that, hey, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a scientist. Um, you choose your life, you know. And obviously, being, having that sort of experience, being a grandson, you know, I've been able to learn mm. a lot of things from him, you know such as being humble, you know, at all times, you know, just that compassion that he has for people from all different backgrounds, you know, it's something that really sticks out and which, you know, will always be part of me, mm. you know what I mean? Because that's what I really identify with. So from him, I got one perspective on that emerging black elite. From the daughter of the president, I got a a different kind of gendered perspective. Uh, here she is, 
uh, uh, one child among about 24, or I think 25, as of last week. Um, feminist, deeply respecting of her father and uh, the history of the ANC and the role that he and her mother played in it, but also struggling with what does it mean to be a cosmopolitan, uh, Afropolitan resident of, of, of Johannesburg, deeply feminist. Uh, her mother uh, uh, now runs the African Union uh, and was uh, one of the uh, uh, pioneers among uh, women in the ANC. Um, so how did she put those two things together? And again, my practice as a, as a journalist is to try to ask very basic questions, very short questions. Uh, when, and, and so I went from that earlier interview with her dad about how, how uh, the second wife was taken, and I simply uh, asked in the second interview with Tutu, how do you understand this relationship between your dad, your mom, the multiple wives, and what is likely to be the future in South Africa for young women, uh, and, and what the implications are for the politics. I assume that nothing has changed for you in terms of seeing that as a viable alternative for yourself or your sisters. Oh, not in a million years. <laughs> so, I mean, we're talking about it in terms of what your dad has chosen. Yes. Not as something you hold up as a... No, it's something I am quite against, well, for myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I would never in a million years enter into any kind of polygamous situation. <laughs> And so do you see that, too, as kind of a generational thing? A kind of generational difference between you and him? Or do you think that um, polygamy and um, the way he's um, conducted his private life is likely to go on, on on some level in South Africa for generations? Do you see it as an ongoing thing or as a, a mm. sort of tradition that will begin to die off? You know, I don't know. The thing is, it's true. I have a lot of friends, obviously, in my age, and majority, and I mean majority of my male friends, are very bad at relationships and are not um, faithful mm. when they're in relationships. So, it's difficult. I mean, they're not necessarily advocates of polygamy, but their behavior is not that different to a kind of the polygamous culture mm. of doing things. So they might look things. down their nose at, at, at somebody who's formerly polygamous, but they're doing the same thing. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yes, yes, that wow. is what I'm saying. Wow. <laughs> so I don't know. So I think, it's, I think it's different. I think definitely there'll be a decrease in people who are polygamous in our generation mm. um, because there's such a limited, yeah, because there's no place for it in modern day South Africa. Um, and how, you know, the gender roles and how, you know, society is now defining and has defined itself. There's really no place for it. Um, but that doesn't mean I think people are going to have happy homes. <laughs> yeah. The third among the well-known uh, names, at least uh, well-known in South Africa, is the son of the uh, leader of the opposition, Helen Zilla. Thomas Marie, he was also a university student and had been in the same high school with Tutu Zuma. They used to sit and argue politics across from each other because their parents are um, heated uh, uh, rivals. And uh, he was my token white, in a way, right, in this group of six. I had to think when I went to do this story about how others, other reporters before me had covered uh, the issue of race in the South African context. And the usual way that it's covered, understandably, is almost as if the South African reality is an extension somehow of the US civil rights movement. Um, and that means that you'd get all this coverage in which the proportion of the coverage was sort of 50-50, 50-50 white and black, in a, in a, in a country where 80% of the population is black. Um, and I very consciously decided that if I was going to have six, there was going to be one white person, but there was going to be one, that uh, five-sixths of this world, of this pie, 
was going to be divided among uh, mixed race and, and black young people. But he was really interesting because the expectation I kind of expected, he would complain about affirmative action and the rest. He, in fact, was the first person who said to me, you know who was most liberated by uh, liberation in 1994? It's young white people. Um, and uh, let me let you hear him uh, tell you why. How free do you feel? Oh, well, from, where, from my background, mm. from growing up with all sorts of kind of opportunities, mm. I feel that I'm, I'm at the pinnacle of what it means to be free. I can I have the opportunity to get a good education, even go on beyond that, go to tertiary education. And I know that uh, the financial problems that, that the majority of people face in this country, I do not face. Mm. So in that way, do, a lot of doors and opportunities open up for me that not a lot of kids have in this country. Mm. So in that way, I, I can, I'm free to sort of <clears throat> control my own destiny and where, what outcome I have in life. I can choose what I want to become or what I want to do. So the twist here, obviously, is that young white people got lifted off of themselves the burden of living in a country in which the politics were defined by an explicit bias towards whites. But because of the deal that was made uh, that led to the first election, that basically one person, one vote would happen, political, full political representation would happen, but nothing fundamentally would change about economic relations, means that 80% of the wealth and land are still held in minority white hands. And as a result of that, a kind of ruction uh, uh, is underway right at the moment about how you get to that more egalitarian society if basically the fundamental structure of uh, inequality, the intertwining of race and class, uh, is still so tightly uh, held. And, and, and of course, that's something uh, that we face today many years on. Uh, after slavery, so it's not a surprise that we would see this 20 years on in the South African context. Um, uh, the three people with, with uh, unknown names uh, ne that have, had never been in print before, Jonathan Persents, a colored boy from the Cape Flats, who allowed me access to the story of what it means to be homeless, uh, what it means to be an orphan, and the logic of the trajectory from runaway to beggar to thief to armed thief and worse. I didn't know all of that uh, when I met him, but in the third or fourth uh, time that I hung out with him and his friends, it was clear to me that they were doing armed robberies. And he ended up, uh, uh, ended up revealing to me that he had been a contract killer for hire. Um, so this aspect of trying to understand why this place with so much promise is also one of the most violent places on the globe in terms of uh, uh, rates of rape and, and, and murder, and why even property crimes are committed in particularly violent ways. He, he gave me access to that part of the story, and that's probably the, 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 the most ethically tricky terrain. I, I traveled uh, during the research for this book. I struggle with, still with many of the issues around my uh, relationship with Jonathan. It took, him a lot, it took a lot of courage for him to agree to use his own name. Uh, the statute of limitations on his crimes have, have not run. Uh, I've never used a pseudonym in any work that I've done, and I still worry almost every day about the consequences of some of those decisions. Um, uh, the fifth one, if you have children, as people with children in the audience know, Brooke would know this very well, you never admit to having a favorite. She is my favorite of the six. Um, Gwendolyn Dubé, uh, raped into HIV at the age of 11 by an uncle, uh, uh, would have uh, died uh, in 2005 when I met her if uh, ARVs had not by then been available in public health clinics. Uh, a story of almost every possible challenge you can imagine uh, being faced at a very young age and 
uh, a symbol, at least for me, of the tremendous resiliency that's sometimes possible in individual lives. She told me on the very first, the very first time I met her in a group interview uh, at, at the hospital at Baraguanath, I, I, I always ask young people both how free do they feel, who they are, where they come from, but also what they want to become. She said she wanted to become a doctor and a pilot. So you can guess instantly what the doctor was about and probably also about what the pilot was about, right? She wanted to be able to treat people like herself. She also wanted the capacity to fly away uh, from a very difficult situation if she needed to. Um, she was in and out of school as uh, somebody uh, who uh, was dealing with her uh, HIV diagnosis and treatment. Um, and didn't get a good in, uh, enough education to become either a pilot or a doctor. But she is a cosmetologist. Um, I helped her get into cosmetology school. And she is a cosmetologist on Generations, which is kind of the most uh, well-known uh, soapy, soap opera in a South African um, television. And she is uh, astonishing and astonishing survivor. Um, and the last person uh, of the six, somebody living in a rural area, um, Vuneni Mabasa, he gives us access to an understanding of why, in spite of the failures of the African National Congress government to deliver on the promises of 1994, which as Nelson Mandela said, was peace, jobs, and justice. One third of that uh, promise came true why uh, people like him continue to return the ANC to power in election after election as the party of liberation. And uh, you know, in brief, the answer to that question is that he has seen in his own village and in his, in his own family the arrival of water, tarred uh, 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 streets, uh, the uh, uh, dominance in politics of people who look like him and sound like him and represent his aspirations. Um, in wobbling back and forth between uh, those rural areas, uh, the life of the Amakaba, and in the cities, uh, spending time with people like us uh, in coffee houses, the Amakoboka, and wobbling back and forth between those two worlds um, uh, is what uh, gave me uh, the framework for doing this kind of exploration of a country that I didn't know at all. I knew less than most of you know about South Africa the, the day I arrived. Um, and it's a kind of immer uh, a discipline called immersion journalism, which I teach. And so I gave myself the tough assignment of trying to do it in this context. Um, I have a lot, of, a, a lot more that I could say. Um, but I want to make sure that I give you uh, a chance to ask what's on your mind uh, based on what I've said uh, so far. So challenges, uh, insults, questions, thoughts. Thanks. No insults? Challenges, yeah. In summary, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the next decade? You know, it's a really good question, and it's the kind of question that politicians are better than answering than journalists. So I'd say I'm, I'm mixed. You know, I think that we have something at stake in the, in the, in, uh, the success of that experiment, uh, because on each of these standards, non-racial, non-tribalism, uh, non-sexism, anti-homophobia, more egalitarian uh, vision for the society. South Africa, the values of South Africa radiate out to the continent and to the rest of the world. So if it fails, it's bad not just for South Africans, it's bad for us. Um, I think that what gives me hope is that kid and Gwendolyn. What gives me Fear is Jonathan's experience and the fact that I know uh, he's on the streets of Cape Town right now looking for a mark. Um, what worries me most 
is that people like us won't see the connection between freedom here and freedom there, won't see the ways in which international trading rules constrain the developing world. Look, 70% of the population of the world lives in <laughs> developing countries, right? And we have a trading and economic system that assumes that it's sustainable for the Chinese to produce all textiles, for Brazil to produce all of the agriculture, for the US to consume most of the world's debt, right? And leaves very little room for a manufacturing capacity in developing countries, which means these ladders of social mobility are forcefully stripped away from developing countries. Um, so we have a stake in knowing that and pushing for the kinds of international arrangements which allow developing countries that kind of manufacturing base that provides avenues for social mobility and makes it less likely that somebody like Jonathan Persanz is going to be on the street with a knife looking for you and much more likely that it'll be like Bunini looking uh, and fighting and studying and fighting hard to, uh, to arrive at a, a middle income status. Yeah. Uh, I'm a journalist who does so much uh, investigative journalism and in-depth uh, work. Thank you. I, I think that the implication of your question is that I need a 12-step program. <laughs> and uh, I think that's probably right. There is a way in which, you know, uh, um, a lot of people would have, I, and I probably would have been smarter to try to make this a two-year project instead of an eight-year project. Um, but. I'm to the point in my career, I mean, I started out doing daily journalism, filing four stories a day and the rest, and that's a discipline I recommend to everybody. It's important to know how to do breaking news and the rest. I'm to the point in my career where I want to be confronting some bedeviling, interesting question. In this case, it was that mystery, you know? Individuals that I know hung up on some slight that happened in their childhood and somehow unable to find the wiggle room to move past it, or something a friend said five years ago, you know, and just stumped and at a dead end because of it. Um, and seeing the same thing society-wide, wanting to see a place where I could kind of be watching for what are the dynamics that allow people to find the wiggle room to move on and where it doesn't. So I'm at, the, I'm at a point where, you know, obviously if I had needed to pay the mortgage uh, with this project, I wouldn't have been able to spend as much time on it. It is a kind of obsessive immersion. You know, I, you know there was a point um, in the, toward the end of the research where my son came to live with me in, in South Africa uh, after law school. And we had this great experience of, of, of living together as adults. Um, he still doesn't pick up his towels in the bathroom. Um, but he, he said to me at one point, you, you know you know a lot more about Vuneni Mabasa than you know about my life in the last four years. So professional risk. You just want to make sure you have people around you who are willing to challenge you. Yeah. Sure. All the time. Okay. Cool. So I don't know if everybody heard, but the question is about in, interracial uh, relationships in the New South Africa, and, uh, and did people talk about it who were around me all the time? Uh, and, and partly as a consequence of that history I mentioned, that one of the first things the apartheid regime does when they come to power 
is make any sexual relationship across these lines, Indian, European or white, African or black, colored or mixed race, any crossing of those lines w was illegal. That's the first act they pass. So, you know, monitoring and controlling the sexual behavior of people was big, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a result of that idea of the svart gavar in Afrikaans, the, the black threat of mixing. And, you know, for people in previous generations, this would have some resonance. Uh, in, in beliefs, not only in this part of the country, but in, in Chicago where I live now. So all the time people talking about what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and the rest. And it's very personal for me now. Uh, in the year my son was in uh, South Africa, he met uh, somebody. They've been together now for uh, six or seven years. She comes from a Zulu-speaking family. And the negotiations are now underway between the two families about whether they can marry. In traditional uh, Zulu culture, that's a long negotiation between families. And there are two uncles who are saying, no, it can't happen. And they're not saying it's because my son is Malungu, white, but because he's not Zulu speaking. So huge, I mean, I think that's a gigantic challenge for the next generation. At the same time in urban areas, for long periods of time, petty speak, speaking people, Sutu speaking people, you know, not as much crossing the color line until after 94. Yeah? Yes. So I don't think it's Wow. Yeah, wow. Well, so the question is about LGBT rights and uh, the persistence of the color line in LGBT communities. Uh, and I think you're, you're spot on. Uh, you know, in the same way that, uh, that gay liberation in the United States in the early years was seen largely as a movement led by privileged white men. Um, it, it's taken a long time for the, both of those uh, needs uh, to, to deal with oppression along lines of uh, uh, romantic attraction uh, and sexual behavior. A, and, and be able to also cross the lines uh, on race that were so electrically charged for so many years. Um, Johannesburg is like the collecting point for uh, LGBT Africans who uh, want to live a fuller, into a fuller expression of themselves, including uh, uh, their um, affiliation and romantic uh, attractions, but don't want to leave the continent. Because as you know, and in, in, probably know, in 38 countries in Africa, uh, any, any form of uh, uh, LGBT sexual expression is criminalized. Time for one more? OK. Back in the back. I interviewed hundreds, and then uh, it, both in group and individual uh, interviews around the country, and then, uh, then focus for the purposes of threading the narrative on the, on the six I've introduced you to. But there's a lot of other voices. Uh, you know, so f for every one of them, there were probably uh, five interviews with groups of their friends. So Thomas Marie's white friends from school, et cetera, various kinds, uh, other uh, groups of young people all over the country. Right, but. Okay. Um, well, I feel like apartheid and post-apartheid is such an in-depth and complicated story. Sure. So how did you really get in there and find the people to interview, choose what was in that process, and then do you feel like you're really able to capture a snapshot of what was going on in such a complex issue? Right. So the last part of the question I'll answer first, no, you never feel like you got it complete, you know, uh, because what I was trying to capture actually was not a snapshot, but a moving picture. 
and a kind of portrait of a generational response to conditions that people inherited. Supposed freedom and, the, and then the reality, material reality of daily life. So no, you always feel like, you know, there are hundreds of other people I could have uh, and should have interviewed. Um, uh, the only thing that gave me enough of an arrogant sense that I had something was being able to bounce back and forth between the social science and the polling, the group interviews, and the deeper individual interviews to see where the trend lines were the same and where there was some kind of backing for major assertions. And those I tried to align in and make sure that the reader understood uh, as they went around. But it's fraught, you know. It, name, you know, you can count the number of lines I was crossing. Uh, I speak one of 11 official languages, occasionally well. But, but you know, being able to read and, and communicate with people other than to do a basic greeting in Qas or Zulu or Peri or Sutu, no, I'm at a loss. I had to use translators. So there are all kinds of ways in which your ability to gather is constrained. And then you try to get around those constraints by making sure that you trust your interlocutor, uh, that you think through uh, what the likely effect of your own identity is, you know? Older, white, American coming into a situation. What are people more likely to tell me, less likely to tell me? How should I be sensitive to that and, and go at it in different angles in order to get as accurate a picture as it's possible to get. I don't think any journalist anymore thinks that they're capable of capturing the truth. I think every journalist ought to be bedeviled by the ambition to get as close as we can. So I'm told that's our time. Thanks for coming. <laughs>